All right, let's start this fucking episode. Please welcome Sydney Ballou. Yay. 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 Yeah, <laughs> waving doesn't work on a podcast, but it does Sorry. work. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. But it does like, work in the video version that you can get on YouTube and patreon.com slash how come. Um, for only five dollars a month. For only five dollars a month, and of course we've got Gabrielle Chichester here, our producer. Gabrielle, how are you? What's good? Just finished a voguing session. You said. I did. I'm tired. Okay. Boots. Well, but but I don't know what that means yet. But you'll figure it out. I've heard <laughs> boots many times. <laughs> <laughs> boots is boots. just like an exclamation point. Yeah, like um. Who says Alyssa Edwards says boots a lot? Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder where she got that from. We'll talk about that. Well, yes. Okay, so let's talk <laughs> about that. So this episode, as we said before, is all about ballroom, ballroom culture, where it came from. Um, Sydney is an expert. He is one of the producers on Legendary, which is um, I, I feel like the first mainstream show that ballroom's been featured in right reality. i mean besides po- besides pose yeah. besides po- yes <laughs> reality show yes reality no, show. yes it's definitely the first competition reality show yes yeah yeah where we're getting to know real houses that exist right now so would you want to give a rundown for our listeners who have never heard of ballroom and are picturing people doing the cha-cha right now what is ballroom where did it come from sure yeah ballroom so ballroom culture is a world of competitive artistry amongst Mm. black and mainly latino lgbtq folks or at least it started out that way um in the black latino lgbtq community Mm -hmm. Uh, ballroom has very extensive roots in new york's incredible like LGBTQ history and Black history Mm -hmm. um, of starting out with balls in Harlem that date Mm -hmm. even back to the 19th century, the Harlem Renaissance. Um, But really, when we think about what ballroom culture is... Wait, 19th century is like 1800s, right? Yes, 1800s. I'm bad at that stuff too. I don't know the difference (laughs) between DC and Washington until this year, and I'm bad at centuries. And I'm not ashamed anymore. I'm holding up my little hand. So that's a very long time ago. Yeah, there were drag balls um, in the 19th century. There were drag balls in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Um, New York has a very interesting history because a lot of drag balls, they come out of these kind of like gentlemen fraternity societies. So for example, the hand... The Hamilton Lodge um, was a place where drag balls would happen. And um, they were actually like a way of raising money for these like fraternal orders. So for for example- For straight men? For straight folks, yeah. So like- Wow. Interesting, I didn't even know this. Yeah, Yeah. I was like, Gabrielle, where are these in my notes? (laughs) (laughs) Listen girl, I just show up to the function. Yeah, no, you brought Sydney to us. You've done, you've done. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so like, you know, it's really interesting if you read like George Chauncey, he has this book, Gay New York, mm-hmm. um, which chronicles a lot of these um, masquerade functions that would happen. And basically, they're a way to raise money. Um, wow. And the idea was, you know, obviously, in this very middle class society, um, at the time, both downtown, because actually, like, there were drag balls that happened from like white fraternal societies and orders um, in places mm-hmm. like Webster Hall in the early 20th century. Um, but there were also African-American counterparts to that. So mm-hmm. uh, places like, uh, as I mentioned, like the Hamilton Lodge, which later uh, they used to hold their functions in Rockland Palace, which um, is way uptown in, um, I mean, it no longer exists. There's like a parking lot there, but it's basically okay. at like- Hey, paradise Avenue. and put up a park <laughs> 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 literally, literally. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, Harlem has this like extensive history of basically uh, these spaces where not only black uh, queens would go and compete, but also white queens would go uptown to mm-hmm. Harlem and, and be able to compete in these functions. And that was part of 
what drew people in is like, you know, it's, it's kind of like the idea of the carnival, right? Of like, mm -hmm. there's this period of time where we can suspend the rules of society around gender and sexuality mm -hmm. and uh, invite people in because they want to see, ooh, who are the interesting characters who are going to show? And that was always the queens who would come. Now, over time, this kind of evolved into, um, you know, at some point, the, dra the drag queens, the queens started doing their own functions. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you get certain people who emerge in the mid 20th century, people like Phil Black, Daisy D. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, when you see a documentary, for example, like The Queen that came out in 1968, this was mm -hmm. a documentary that shows a drag competition in the 1960s. And they become mm -hmm. kind of like uh, almost like Miss America pageants at that point. And, okay. um, and so ballroom actually, I mean, really when people think about like, when does this whole phenomenon start? It actually comes out of the 1970s when the first house is created, the House of Abasia in 1972. Okay. So, See, that, okay, so that's where we start in our notes. It said with origins as far back as the 20s, ballroom culture, yes. as we know, it came to be in the 1960s as a result of trans woman, Crystal Abasia being fed up with racism in the mainstream drag ball scene in New York. Well, that is one part of history. Okay. Crystal Abasia is an interesting figure. Um, she's featured in this documentary, The Queen, and, um, and she kind of has this like breakout moment at the end. It's a very, very helpful um, documentary. What's interesting though is like ballroom emerges in the 1970s from this world of kind of drag pageantry, which is what it was at the time. Mm -hmm. And actually, I mean, there's a whole, I mean, I could go very, very deep into like language and how this changes because actually the yeah. world of drag competition in the 1950s and 60s, um, these people did not consider themselves drag queens because drag mm -hmm. queen back then mm. kind of referred to sex workers, street workers. Um, they were actually in the business of female impersonation. And so uh, in the 50s and 60s, this was kind of like a golden era of that, that world of female impersonation. You had venues like Club 82, which was in the Lower East Side. And you know, back then the mob controlled basically mm -hmm. the neighborhood and access to these kind of venues and things. Um, but the, the idea was simple. It was like there were these masquerade balls that would happen at different times of the year. Yeah. You would have a lot of people dress up. Sometimes there'd be a couple of categories and then somehow in the 70s, and this is actually the part of the research that I'm like trying to piece together at the moment, you get the emergence of a very particular Black and Latino LGBTQ scene where people are doing that same level of competition. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of interesting with ballroom is like, well, one, it's called ballroom because the venues in which these competitions were held were in Harlem. And these former ball, like literally yeah. ballrooms mm -hmm. where people would, you know, dance and do these kinds of things in the 1920s. And so by the 70s, these venues become spaces for this very particular type of drag competition that was happening, specifically amongst what we would consider today probably to be trans women. Right. So again, the language around this is kind of difficult because, you know, in the 1960s, 70s, people did not use the term trans in that way. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And uh, there was kind of, I would say, it was more, um, like, I wouldn't say gender diverse, but just maybe more fluid. Or I, I feel like a lot of the identities, the labels that we use for gender and sexual orientation identities today were not necessarily the same that people used at the time. Definitely. So, yeah. So yeah, but but generally it's like there's the one song in Rocky Horror that I think we all know that we're just like. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, like a transvestite from Transylvania. I mean, I, it's interesting because, like, again, these terms around trans, whether it's transvestite, transsexual, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, the trans community only start to coalesce around the term transgender. I would say in like the 90s and 2000s mm -hmm. and a lot of that has to do with like health outreach and what um, like health workers the kind of language they were using so it's kind of interesting how yeah. like you know people weren't necessarily using these terms but then they kind of like emerged for a various political reasons but um, at least to this question about ballroom ballroom history um, just for <laughs> for the record mm -hmm. I mean ballroom is a world of competition between groups called houses who are like chosen mm -hmm. families. Um, and at these competitions or balls, 
um, that are held in different venues. There's different competition categories and people walk these categories and compete yes. for trophies and prizes. And of course, like status overall, which is like a whole other topic that mm-hmm. we can get into. What but, house are you in Sydney? Yes, so. what house are you in <laughs> Sydney? It's kind I'm in of a, a big th- deal. Yes, I'm in, you know, the house of extravaganza. Which, the legendary house of extravaganza. Yes, iconic, the, no? I, iconic. Yes, I mean, all of these things. We don't even need those signifiers because we are extravaganza and you already know what it gives. Mm-hmm. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you become a part of the house of extravaganza? Have you been in any other houses before? Because I yeah. know Gabrielle was formerly a ninja. Yes. A and now he's ninja. a red one. Indeed. Reformed ninja. A reformed ninja. <laughs> it's funny because um, I was never officially a ninja. I was um, mm. a potential oh. ninja for a long time. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's my business. Um, <laughs> but it's funny because uh, actually, uh, so I'm in the House of Revlon, like you said, the unforgettable iconic House of Revlon. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny because Sid was actually in my house for one week before I ever joined. Wow. <laughs> You're such a mess. It was a, it was a <laughs> months. That's a whole month. Yeah. Mess. Well, <laughs> well, okay. So yeah, I was in a house before. The first house I was in was in the house of Ultra Ami. Um, I started actually in the ballroom scene in Europe. I mm-hmm. started walking balls in Berlin. Shout um, out to the European ballroom scene. Mm-hmm. European ballroom scene. They're great people. Um, I won a trophy, <laughs> my first trophy in Dusseldorf, as you do. Mm -hmm. and um got deeper into the ballroom scene in paris and london um so i was an omni for some time and then um you know it was clear it was time for me to leave last year and it's so wild because i so for me i'm a trans guy i walk uh old way performance which Mm -hmm. is the original way of voguing so you know lines precision you know voguing which everybody thinks was made i mean like popular by oh, it was made famous by madonna in that video in vogue yes but she a lot of people don't know was taking from ballroom culture or you know yes so here's the cool thing jose extravaganza who's my father the father of the house of extravaganza mm-hmm. he was her dancer and choreographer along with louis extravaganza who was also a member of the house mm-hmm. um and jose uh, you know he auditioned and was chosen as her dancer choreographer taught her how to vogue so and basically cool taught the entire world how to vote because I mean he so and Lewis are in cool. the music the video. He, yeah he's an icon he's an icon of icons and incredible and also just an incredible person and yeah, he is. just so sweet but yeah he definitely is the person who took voguing really mm-hmm. beyond the mainstream um but and there's a yeah. massive intersection between balls and fashion too so I was watching Legendary with my boyfriend and I was explaining to him I said there's a lot of like, do you know what Balmain is like, or Balmain, like a lot of people pronounce it or whatever. Like there's a lot of (laughs) houses named after like Evangelista, like Linda Evangelista, like models or um, designers, like there's Mizrahi's, there's- um, I should probably say Evangelista is not a real house. (laughs) Well, but it's in Pose. But it's on Pose, Pose. yeah. But it's in Pose, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's an overlap, definitely. But, um, Mm -hmm. and, and that was, like I only, I learned about voguing uh, and it wasn't even from Madonna. I learned it from when Benny Ninja was brought on America's Next Top Model to teach yes. the girls mm-hmm. how to vogue. So me and Remy actually discovered Vogue the same exact way. Mm-hmm. Um, I also discovered Vogue first through Benny Ninja on America's Next Top Model. And then when I was in about fifth grade, I think that was the season of America's Best Dance Crew, where mm-hmm. Vogue Evolution, and like little did I know, as like a 10-year-old, that like, you know, 10 years later, I would be a part of that same scene and culture. It's so cool. Well, it's also like, I, I just remember learning about first voguing, and she, Tyler said something about an underground culture, you mm. know? Interesting. And, and, but it wasn't, it wasn't co- totally clear. And then I remember when I learned about drag, which is a completely different art form in itself, but like, you know, people think of connected or whatever. Both of those things I would think of, I would be like, okay, those are really great things, but what are you gonna do with them if eventually like there is no mainstream? You know, how do you make money? Why would you be dedicating your life to this stuff? And it's because of progress, which we have been seeing that 
it does eventually make it into the mainstream because such talented things are coming out of these communities. Yeah, and I, I would also say, you know, why would you do it? Because it's it's part of your life, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like, it's voguing really is- a lifestyle. Vogue, yeah, it's a lifestyle, voguing, voguing, and just ballroom culture. I mean, it's, it's beyond, I think, uh, there's so many aspects of it. I mean, when, when I say it's a culture, I really mean capital C, like mm -hmm. there's yeah. music that goes with it, there's dance, there's language, there's language I mean, yeah. all these words. There's that folks family. Use. There's mm -hmm. family, exactly, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's it's not it's not a luxury, and it's it's definitely. I mean, even for me, I just wrote this piece um, in the New York Times about um, how folks have been still connecting through quarantine mm -hmm. um, in the ballroom community, both through uh, like voguing with each other on like you know on, on Zoom. Zoom. Yeah, I've seen that. Other but platforms. Also online balls as well. But, uh, yeah, online balls. And then of course with protests that are going on of like people not only finding solidarity with like their houses and sort of speaking up against injustice, mm -hmm. but you know, just also connecting. It's, it's just like, it's part of who we are and what we're about. And um, it goes even beyond, you know, I, I feel like these mainstream moments of ballroom are pretty cool. And I, I mean, it also depends on sort of what your intention is in the community, because there mm -hmm. are, there is such a wide gamut of people. I mean, literally ballroom is the kind of place where you have people who are like eye bankers and then they like vote for fun. And then you have people who are like, you know, they have like less than five dollars in their pocket and this is part of their life and like who they are mm -hmm. and everything and they also do that too and you know you get such a wide range because it's new york city because you know it's like for me i've always felt like with with black culture when we talk about things like dance or music um i think you know it goes beyond i would say like a kind of western conception of culture which is like okay, here's my life over here, and then I go to the theater, and then I go mm. see a ballet, yeah. and then I come mm -hmm. back home. It's like, no, it's integrated into you, our lives. It's yeah. like so it. essential. You really do live it. Yeah, it, yeah um, you live it. It's, it's like oxygen. You need it to, like, exist. Yeah. And, I, I mean, even for me, I get, it's like, I get crunchy if I, if I don't vogue. Same. Yeah. Get, like, you, I, that's, yeah. I mean, I have I, to feel it. I, I get I, angry. I, I get frustrated, yeah. I think that's like the most important part of it too. And that's what I really learned when I saw Paris is burning was like, it's like, this is not just like something you do that's like fun. It's like a lot of these people were um, cast out by their own families, needed new families. And so their houses aren't just a thing that it's like, okay, we compete together. It's like, we live together. Um, yeah. They take each other in. It's the first time a lot of people are like, being loved by their new chosen families. Yes, definitely. As who they are. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, I would. I'd say for me, yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, Sid. It's a, it's an inseparable part of like my life for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and it really is a culture and lifestyle for me. Um, you know, luckily I was like lucky to have a family that like you know loved me and didn't reject me um mm -hmm. because of my sexuality but vogue and ballroom in general for me has been extremely healing mm -hmm. um in terms of accepting like my femininity and like mm -hmm. having my femininity celebrated and like put on a pedestal yeah right Definitely. i remember when step i step your first... pussy up <laughs> like i've never heard more positive words surrounding pussy than in the ballroom scene like cunt is yeah. good you know, uh, like, good, fish is good, is good. You know, like, <laughs> if you hear fish and pussy in the same word as, like, a ninth grade girl, you're like, oh, you're talking about stinky fish pussy and nobody's ever going to want to go down on me. But it's <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, fish <laughs> means, like, sexy woman, like, giving right. you filth fish. <laughs> yeah, and especially <laughs> as, as a black man right mm -hmm. like growing up and like being um scolded for like any little sign of like femininity mm. um, yeah to them yeah. be told then to them be told by like my my mother that like i my ballroom mother that i need to be more feminine yeah right. And, right and that journey has been very interesting so you're absolutely right that it's it's something that i think those of us who are in the culture like really need need in our lives yeah, yeah totally totally yeah acceptance is a main huge huge part um and yeah i mean you know i have a similar story as a trans guy for me like really owning my masculinity and being celebrated 
for it for the first time really in my life is like mm -hmm. huge and and ballroom is is about that and i think for me also personally it just being able to access black culture because i mean the first my first interaction with ballroom was when i was in europe and i remember you know talking to my german non-binary pole dancing roommate about paris is burning and then mm -hmm. they tell me oh you could take a voguing class and i'm thinking like wow how is this part of my culture even here and yeah. um mm -hmm. how amazing is it that i get to access that and access myself and feel good in who I am um, by just being in this community. So yeah, it is, it is truly amazing. I was just going to say, um, I think Technu might love ballroom because yeah, uh, the <laughs> Zoom limit was just extended. We just got a gift. <laughs> Technu has final, finally figured himself out. I'm like honored. <laughs> Um, like Technu is giving us tens. Yeah, tens Yay. across the Zoom screen. Um, so I, I would love, like said, to hear um, a little bit about uh, categories. Uh, I don't know. Well, yes, but specific categories actually. Um, mm -hmm. So wait, before we do that, can I yeah. ask a question? <laughs> okay. Because some of the cat, okay, so there's a lot of categories that people compete in. Yes. Two of the categories are face and body. Uh huh. And it's like in Paris is Burning, a lot of the verbiage that was used was how well are you passing? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Which now, which is like, how, how are you? passing in main to mainstream other people as a woman that you identify as a woman or for the women who do mm -hmm. maybe this is a, a later question all right well, well, well wait what's what's your question let's well let's because because now the like i was trying to explain it during legendary that like i was like passing now gets confusing because Passing so you want to have a conversation around realness. Yeah, I well, guess so. Well, there's, okay, there's two, there's different things at work. Okay. okay? So when you have a category, right, usually mm -hmm. the category um, will also include either um, a gender or a sexual orientation associated mm -hmm. with it. And mm -hmm. the idea of that is actually born out of fairness. So okay. if you have a face category and it's about who has the most beautiful face really mm -hmm. is what that comes down to. Um, oftentimes it'll be like separated. So we have butch queen face and in mm -hmm. ballroom, butch queens refer to gay or bisexual men, cisgendered me. men. I'm a butch um, queen. Okay. And um, you know, if, if, and let's say it's that category, butch queen face, then you have all the gay or bisexual cisgender men compete against each other who has the most beautiful face amongst them? Now, um, when you have other categories- Beautiful according to what standard? Well, that's obviously a good question. And that's the question for the judges because, okay. you know, it they kind of have their, on the panel. Mm -hmm. One, yeah, everyone has their own criteria, but also it's a question of how the category is written on the flyer. So, right. you know, mm -hmm. if, if it's also like, you know, who has, you know, maybe there's some scenario that goes with it. It's like, you know, oh, there's a nuclear explosion, your face is saved, who has the most beautiful face? Well, mm -hmm. if, you, if you have a little production to your, to your face, you know, let's say you come in with a gas mask and you reveal it and you look gorgeous. Well, yeah. maybe you'll, you'll win over somebody else because you put in the effort to read it's the flyer. It's about selling it as or well. Or like if your beard is even just like perfectly trimmed and in like a cool fashion. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's things like that. I mean, it depends. Beards are kind of actually, I mean, that's a whole Controversial. Thing. Are they? Well, <laughs> well, controversial in the face category it is. Okay. It's funny because ballroom has, I feel like, its own aesthetic in a certain way. Like, mm -hmm. there's, there's even, like, certain aesthetics that are seen as, like, more favorable for certain categories. And, like, yeah, beards usually aren't one. But I think what you were referring to was about realness. And so mm. realness is actually... Um, there are different types yes. of realness categories, mm -hmm. and realness refers to the, abil the ability, as Dorian Corey says it very beautifully in Paris is Burning, the ability to blend into society. And mm -hmm. those are usually mm -hmm. when there are archetypes of kind of like straight society 
that then either A, as I mentioned, butch queens will compete in in a category amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. Femme queens or trans women may compete in a category amongst themselves. There are trans men who also, we have our own realness categories. Mm -hmm. And those can vary. I mean, sometimes it could be like thug realness for butch queens, right? Okay. You have to like look yeah, like Yeah, that was something whatever. I did, like businessman realness. You know, yeah, that's not something realness. you Executive think. realness. Executive yeah. realness. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Executive yeah. producer realness? <laughs> <laughs> close to that yeah 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 no and and I mean that was actually one of the I, pieces that I had written last year in op-ed because there's been a debate in the ballroom community about you know we're at this point where there is so much LGBTQ visibility uh in movies and you know TV but also I think in just kind of like the corporate world in general you know it's mm -hmm. like pride last year was like so corporatized in a certain so way yeah. um so there's there's all these questions about well you know either a do we need this category anymore um also b like is it is it as surprising because in the 80s it was surprising for you know to be a gay man in, right. in corporate america because you didn't see people like that right 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 but but or a military always, uniform military you know i mean that's before mm -hmm. you know don't ask don't tell that kind of stuff so you know this i think um you know there are a lot of questions about well what is the future of these categories um but i i think um yeah it's it's you know i was i was saying that what i think is for me what's most entertaining is when people do realness categories and it's not just about you know how straight or cisgender you can look but it's actually about you playing a character mm -hmm. of yeah. sorts so for ex the example i gave was um um uh was it rucka revlon he told me this story where My the category the yeah yeah rucka's amazing it was a category was about you had to bring it like clark kent it was butch queen mm. executive realness and so he had this whole i mean he did this whole superman thing he like had somebody come out he took these photos of himself in a superman suit in times square and like he came, out of an this, icon. he came out on this gorgeous business suit and you know it had his superman thing underneath if he needed to pull that out but you know the glasses he had business cards made that said you know the whatever i think forgets like planet you know newspaper etc cetera, etc cetera. so he had Daily this, planet. like yeah, Daily Planet. Yeah. So he had like Daily Planet business cards and he gave those out to the judges. And, you know, in a sense, it's like he's, awesome. really, Cl he's really Clark Kent, you know what yeah. I mean? It's not just, oh, you're the straight guy who is Clark Kent. It's like, no, I'm you're so real that character. I'm giving you, yeah, mm -hmm. these business cards and I'm, you know, but. I'm giving anyway. you realness. No, but when people, like, some people are going to be hearing this and like, I remember when I watched Paris is Burning for the first time and I was like, oh, realness. <laughs> you know like I'm almost kind of embarrassed that I was like face and body and stuff but like but when people are saying like you're giving me babysitter realness or whatever like it's coming yeah. from ballroom mm -hmm. yes yeah and actually yeah. it's funny because that's actually it's a bit of a how do I say this to me this is one of the terms that I think has been completely misappropriated mm -hmm. because Absolutely. realness yeah. is about illusion it's yeah. about you're not this thing but you're you not that look thing you look like you but are. But you're giving me that thing. You're giving that yeah. thing, yeah. Right. Whereas people, because when people say realness, they mean authenticity and actually it's the exact opposite. And it's opposite. the opposite. Yeah. Oh, speaking is... of, do you know that they just made irregardless a word in the dictionary? Oh, interesting. Because so I mean, many people just say it. Just say it? <laughs> yeah. So Including Mariah Carey. Yeah, like it's regardless. Like what do you not understand? Whatever, anyway. <laughs> But um, I so yeah. I would love like uh, Sydney to have a, a conversation around um, some other categories specifically. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously all the really types of voguing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh so there's okay. uh, well voguing. So yeah, you have a uh, Vogue Femme, mm -hmm. uh, old way, which Sydney is amazing at, mm -hmm. and uh, new way. Mm -hmm. which is stretchy um old ways like... so so yeah so with with voguing it first started out as it was created by paris dupree there's so many like legends i'm i'm also trying to like tie this stuff together for the book but one of the stories is paris dupree who through the series paris is burning balls 
um, mm -hmm. that she would be seen in the back of Better Days, which was like a nightclub in uh, Midtown that a lot of Black and Latino LGBTQ folks would go to, and she would carry on in the back. And then there's also this story that when uh, the ball, before the balls would start, that she would be carrying on, you know, kind of feeling it on the floor and people would go nuts. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of emerged into what became later known as Pop, Dip and Spin, or performance mm -hmm. and pop, dip and spin. The idea with voguing then was you had to pop, like there had to be like a pop element to you. Um, you had to go into a dip, which is when, you know, people do those amazing back bends on the floor. That and not a shablam. Sorry, drops. I just wanna, I just wanna pause, yeah. not a death drop. Yeah. Yes. Not a shablam. Not, not also, a shablam, but a dip, yes. A dip. But, but isn't shawam acceptable? <laughs> Yeah, so actually, yeah. that's that's okay. how you say that, because actually, okay, so Shawam, that term comes from Jack Mizrahi, who is my writing partner on, on uh, Legendary. Mm -hmm. um, Jack is a famous commentator in the ballroom scene, and a ballroom mm -hmm. historian himself as well, and he, on the mic, you know, you have this person who's called the commentator, and mm -hmm. that do person... That. You do? Yeah, that's what I mainly do. That's my main Oh my god, yeah. I it took me, like two seasons of Pose to realize Pray Tell's name was Pray Tell and <laughs> not that people were just saying it to him a lot. So and they're people, like, you're being unfair, Pray Tell. And I'm like, okay. Some people ask me, especially people who are less familiar That's with funny. the culture, they're like, oh, so you're like Pray Tell on Pose. And I'm like, technically, I guess it's the same function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the way well, that commentation has evolved from the time period that Pose uh, it takes place in, yeah. it's a right. very different uh, art form. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, and Pray Tell's character is based off of Junior Labeja in Paris is right. Burning, who did commentate a lot of balls. And the role of the commentator, you know, you are kind of like the referee, you're the person who's kind of keeping things in order. Um, it's like an MC slash host, but then their other role is to help get people hyped for the category. Mm -hmm. So, and they do this thing called chanting. And so chanting is kind of like, uh, it's almost like rap in a way, but it's its own thing. Yeah. And it's a way of- I never of, know how to explain of, it to people. <laughs> yeah, it's a way of like, you know, you're, you're basically coming up with very clever rhymes on the fly that go to the house music that's playing while the category yeah. is going. And then you also are the person who's kind of in charge of, you know, tallying up all the other votes for the judges and kind of queuing up the next person walking the category. So Wait, it's a it's a very important role and it's it's hard it to is. do. And and really the person, I mean, there are many people who have pioneered this, but the biggest person is Jack Mizrahi because mm -hmm. Once Jack really um, entered the scene and he truly carved out a space for himself and for future commentators in that regard because of not only his clever chants and, you know, the things that he did, but, um, yeah, you know, he, paved he's the just, way for he really paved yeah. the way for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, in, in, um, in Legendary, the commentator, it, he's doing it the whole time. I didn't even realize he was doing it Deshaun. for a really long time, Deshaun. And then at yes. the end of it he was and hold that pose for me right. and I was like oh he's saying this yeah. <laughs> he's been saying this this whole time I want to okay. I want to make an aside just because yeah. we mentioned Deshaun commentating yeah Sydney so Sydney is a producer on, on Legendary. Legendary on HBO Max <laughs> mm -hmm. Thursday every Thursday mm -hmm. um and I just have a question I need the tea because uh -oh. You know, in the ballroom. I'm like, should I consult my lawyer on this real quick? <laughs> no, no, no. You know, in the ballroom, the girls, you know, like mess. So, <laughs> I, I have a question about I this. Think I love. I, that's why I love ballroom. <laughs> <laughs> For the messiness. You're yeah, messy. I'm so, a mess. So, could you tell us like the editing? So, when we see like the battles and the performances on Legendary. Right. Is it a dubbed over track? Because everybody knows right, that Deshaun in his life would never commentate off beat. I know, I know. This is Wait, one of like off the beat? Big, yeah, this is one if of like the If you watch the show, it's off beat. Wait, everything's off beat. Okay. <laughs> so I, I can't speak I, to post because <laughs> yes. my role, my role. Right, on I know show, you're not an editor. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. I okay, but not I am an editor and I noticed <laughs> that 
even the dance, <laughs> the dances don't look as precise because of the editing. Right, yeah. yeah and that, the lip that's... syncing doesn't look as precise because no shade to your show. But, <laughs> no shade, no shade. <laughs> no shade, no shade. But I, I, yeah, what's going on? I don't know. These are questions for Scout Productions probably, but um, <laughs> yeah, I actually, uh, yeah, we, you know, obviously Deshaun was on beat and everything during the taping of the show. Mm -hmm. We don't control posts, sadly. Like they did not consult mm. uh, me or Jack on that. So I cannot speak to these questions because yes, I, I think for quite a few of the performances there, you're kind of seeing highlights um, and right. you're not seeing like the kind of continuous performance. These were, I guess, stylist, stylistic yeah. decisions from Scout Productions. I will have to. So, also, yeah, sure, you did your job. You. No, yeah, you, you I, we your know, job. we know you did your job. But as an editor, even Ben and I, Ben and I are both editors, and we were like, the angles that they don't show the right angles for certain moves and stuff. So you're not getting how sickening some of the performances really are. Yeah, um, I, yeah. This is kind of one of the harder. Again, like I wish, I wish also, I had more sway in that department. It, it could be it. because it's the first time that this is broadcast. You know, like on a on the mainstream level, that maybe like maybe the editors aren't as familiar with it. Yeah, I, you know, I don't again, know. Like, I, I don't can't, know. I wish I could like give you like a real answer about this because I, I just don't know, you know, for me, it's like, I think, I mean, I know, I'll put it like this. I think ballroom, honestly, like my opinion about ballroom, I think one thing that can sometimes get a little confused is, so there's a difference between concert dance and commercial dance. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're, if you're familiar with this, but like concert dance is stuff like ballet, um, you That's know, me. Alvin Ailey, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, Martha Graham, the stuff that you see on the stage. And then commercial dance is, is like music videos and the MTV awards and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And the mm -hmm. difference between the two is that with commercial dance, the purpose is to highlight one thing, right? right. So like if it's, if it's uh, Britney Spears with a snake, there's all these people dancing around her. But she's the, the point focal is, point. She's the focal point. When you're watching like, you know, Missy Elliott's performance, there's like, five things going on in multiple parts of the stage. So you're cutting in between these things because there's like all this action that's happening. Mm -hmm. Now concert dance is different because it's a little more passive. It's like you as the viewer, you're watching, your eye gets to travel across the stage. To mm -hmm. me, this is like what you see when you're watching Ginger Rogers and like Fred Astaire dance is like, you get the wide widescreen shot. So mm -hmm. that the wide angle shot so that you as the viewer can decide where you want to look. Whereas with, I think with commercial dance, the, um, you know, the director's making the decision, decision for you. They're saying, look here, look here, look here, when they cut to different places. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, these are kind of like stylistic choices, you know, to each their own. Um, I personally think because Ballroom comes out of the 1970s, comes out of a more Martha Graham, Alvin Ailey, like that mm -hmm. tradition of dance, um, I think ironically to some people, it's actually more in the vein of that type of dance where you want to see the full per performance continuously because there's so much right. going on. And the purpose is, you know, because when you're behind the judge's table, if you go to a ball, that's like the best vantage point because, mm. and that's usually what you see when you watch like a YouTube clip is like, the cameras right. behind the judges' table, so that and everybody's you, playing to the judges, and you can decide what you're looking at. What and you can looking. see the full team effort, and you can see the synchronicities, and you can see people going off and doing their things. Exactly, exactly. Now, again, I did not have any sway in post, so we know. Yeah, I, I we know. Make those decisions. We but, know. You know, but obviously, you know, in the future, when you know my time comes, and you know all that, I will definitely make different decisions. But yeah, I mean, I personally think you know ballroom kind of comes more out of that concert tradition. And I think it's also why sometimes people have a hard time of capturing voguing because it's like mm -hmm. sometimes it's an experience. See, it's an ex yeah, and and it's really one of those things that you have to do live, like in it. You have to mm -hmm. be because when you're yeah. there at the ball, it's about the feeling, it's about the movement, it's about people cheering, and you know it's that energy, and it's it's very hard to replicate that on, yeah. screen, on screen. Yeah. Um, and I think there are ways that you know people kind of get around that, like. You know, I think part of what makes the title sequence so gorgeous, I mean. Oh, you know, I love the title sequence. It's amazing. 
it's it's also because if you saw the way it was shot like the the camera person was like right in there with the mm-hmm. dancers and mm-hmm. i i remember talking to so tanisha scott who's the choreographer on the show i mean really a lot of her role i mean she did a lot but like one of the things is like she was really good with blocking and um, I had asked her, I was like, you know, what do you think is um, one of the best ways to, to film voguing? And she said with voguing, it's about the feeling. And the way that you get the feeling with a camera is being intimate mm-hmm. and close to somebody. So mm-hmm. it's, it's also hard to, you know, either replicate that on, on the stage. But it'll um, get but, better. Because again, yeah. this is the first time. And also like something about the show, because it is mainstream, and I'm sure this was something that you and all the other producers discussed and whatever, is that the judges panel really only has one person from the world of ballroom who knows, you know, what they're talking about in regard to categories. Like when we were talking about, um, there was, there was old, old wave Vogue, Vogue, new wave Vogue, uh, Femme Queen, and I was noticed, sorry, Vogue Femme, and um, I noticed that while they were trying to judge them, Mm -hmm. um, Laomi, who is from the world of ballroom, was teaching Jamila Jamil, like, okay, Mm -hmm. this is good because they're supposed to do stretching in New Wave. Okay, this is good because in Old Wave, they're supposed to be more angular and stuff. You know, okay, this is good because in Vogue Femme, they're supposed to be more... um, fluid movements or whatever which is yeah. like so what's the tea what's so, the tea well Who tra- <laughs> i was just gonna say that i felt a little let down. i was excited as somebody who loves to learn mm-hmm. i don't want to watch somebody else learn i want to be taught mm. by the panel i want them to be pros it's a it's a tough tough thing because i yeah. i think with ballroom it intersects so many things one i will say this there's already kind of historical precedence for the inclusion of celebrities in in balls people okay. don't know okay. like cool. for example fun fact patricia field the patricia Ooh. field of sex, sex in, the in the city, city. Uh, the devil wears prada she had a house a house the house of fields there were wow. a bunch of yeah. Ball- yeah there's actually a documentary Willie Lynch was a field for a yeah there's there's a documentary actually coming out. There's an interesting history there. First, like, basically, a lot of the ballroom kids used to hang out at her boutique on the Lower East Side. Mm-hmm. And then one of her, like, the people who worked there was like, hey, let's start a house. They mm-hmm. started the House of Field. And yes, uh, Willie Ninja, in his, like, long history, I mean, the House of Ninja has a very interesting history, one of which was, like, Willie would often, like, open and close the house. Close the and house a lot. Yeah. So, like, in 1988, he, like, closed the house, and then he became a member of the House of Field. And what's mm. interesting is, like, Patricia Field, she threw this ball. You could, like, watch the clip on YouTube. Um, and she had, like, Debbie Harry on the panel, uh, several other celebrities. Um, there's also a history of, like, Naomi Campbell used to learn how to walk the runway. She used to go to the piers and... The, mm-hmm. the queens would teach her how to walk, she and Christy Turlington. Um, so there's always kind of been an overlap. You know, Andre Leon Telly has been not sat on a panel mm-hmm. before. Um, mm-hmm. So the idea of like celebrities being judges, we've already had this. This is kind sure. of like a continuation of that. Yeah. Now, when it comes to like, you know, having a show, because this is the thing that's difficult. We're talking about, like you said, this is the first time ever. Mm-hmm. We are talking about an intersection of ballroom and television, which has its own kind of rigmarole in a way. And yeah, it's like what's wild great... and out and dance crew. It's like, what did we do for that? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But also like, how do you keep a show in the air, first of mm-hmm. all? How do you, how do you even yeah, get a show sure. in the air? Mm-hmm. And also sure. what what's great is, okay, Law, yes, he's not from ballroom, but he's ballroom adjacent. He's been okay. to countless balls. So he is very familiar with the world. Deshaun, who's the commentator on the show, also from Ballroom, amazing, amazing. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, like, it's helpful when you're working on a TV show to have somebody who understands TV, because <laughs> mm-hmm. actually that is like a whole skill unto itself. Yeah. Um, sure. And so, like, you know, and also I think one of the things that is important in this moment that we're in, you know, we're in this like transformative moment with protests and everything, and we're thinking about how do we rebuild our world. For me, what's important is getting rid of the uh, the toxic idea that you need to know everything mm. like i i think this is actually like what's humbling i think is great and great is to have somebody who's in that position who doesn't know everything about mm. ballroom because when you're watching i think like for those of us who are either in the lgbtq community or adjacent 
there's so many people outside of that who I think would benefit greatly from learning about ballroom. And instead yeah. of feeling ashamed, like they're appropriating something that like you can actually welcome them in and be like, look, not everybody here knows. Normalize learning. Thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, That's and fair. And to yeah. be honest, you know, it's like for Laomi and Deshaun, yes, they're on Vogue Evolution, but they haven't been on a TV show like this before. Right. So, right. so it's interesting because you have like a various, various levels of knowledge. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's the other thing. It's like, you know, somebody like Megan, who is amazing. I love Megan so much. Um, yeah. she, you know, she's an incredible performer. And that also translates to ballroom because yeah, ballroom definitely. is about, you need to bring it at a hundred percent. Like, and and that's actually something I feel like anybody can see because totally. when you go, you, you know, when you go to a ball, you watch a battle. I mean, you can you can tell who's really giving you a hundred and twenty percent. Yeah, who is right. paying whether you, you know? know ballroom or not. Yeah, exactly. And so so that but also kind of comes through on their show. When it comes down to like those final battles or something, yes, right. Both people are giving so much energy. There are so many dips happening. There is so much spinning. There is so much hairography. Your mind is blown to the right. point that I'm like, okay, what are the judges going to say about technical stuff? How are right. they going to technically separate what somebody's doing right and somebody's doing wrong? The same way I've watched gymnastics and be right. like, why, like, why didn't she get a 10, you know? Right. And it was like right. the landing or whatever. And, um, <laughs> Yeah. And I think, I think for that reason, it's probably a good idea that the judges either have a 10 or a cut because a chop, it, yes. it, or a chop, like, it's like there, you can't, some of them don't have the vernacular to give a seven yet. It could either right. be, it's like, yes, I really, really like that. Or like, I didn't think you gave enough. Right. Well, there's I mean, actually, that, that, that doesn't was, really happen anymore. There, there, there like, is no, uh, there's not really. Reading? There's no what? Sorry. There's there's not really anything anymore that's not a ten. Or there's no numbers. Well, Interesting. No, okay. Well, no, well, At least no, in, in my experience no, in, in ballroom. No, in, in ballroom, it's you know basically you have this kind of like preliminary round, right? Which we call getting your tens. And the idea tens, is yeah. all the judges have to give you a ten in order for you to advance to compete in the next rounds, right? Mm -hmm. That will whittle you down to the final battle. And it's, it's interesting because, like, historically, it used to be there were different numbers, like, 1 through 10. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. over time, right, because you see that on Pose. That's something that yeah. they, they showed. Right. It's like, yeah, it used to be possible to get, like, a 6 or a 7. But then over time, and, you know, this is something I'm also looking into, it became a pass-fail system where it was either a 10, we see it, or a chop, and you're out. Mm -hmm. And it might also have to do, honestly, with just the number of people walking time. because – right. Because yeah. uh, you do need doing the like, math would be tough. Oh yeah, you do need yeah. a system yeah. at some point when you got yeah. like fifty girls walking a category, right. and we only got you know yeah. how much time for the ball. Mm -hmm. So and I do really so, want to yes. make the yeah sorry. So yeah, you you, you do have that like t tens and chop system, but I think honestly for the judges, you know, it, and this happens any at any ball as well. It's like sometimes the judges will choose, and you know, there's a certain criteria. There's something that they see. Also, they have a particular vantage point. So there's also sometimes stuff mm -hmm. that they see that you might not be able to see as well. And then you go back and you watch a clip and you're like, oh, okay, I can see why they chose that mm -hmm. person. But sometimes, you know, people are at such a, such a very, very, very high level of technical skill. You know, sometimes it really, for judges, it's like they have a preference too. For some of them, they're like, okay, I prefer to see <laughs> like a soft and kind form, form of Vogue, which is more slowed down versus like dramatics, which is like very, very fast and and you know, did you say soft off. and cunt? Yeah, so, yeah, That's there's a type of Vogue Femme that I do. Yeah, oh. there's, there's, there's there's two styles. So, Vogue Femme, right? It's it's actually a form of voguing <laughs> that comes from the femme queens or trans women. Mm -hmm. Um, you had butch queens or the gay and bisexual men in the ballroom scene who would imitate them. Um, and so this became known as Vogue Femme. And the idea is you're a butch queen voguing like a femme queen, and then they shortened it to butch. But, or sorry, to Vogue Femme. And so with that, there's two styles. One is soft and cunt, which is like very slowed down, very sensual, very mm -hmm. sexy. Um, and then dramatics. Very Gabrielle. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then, and then with dramatics, you know, this is like, um, I don't know, it's almost like a woman possessed. It's cat, like, cat, you know, yeah, you're, you know, you're spinning <laughs> off of uh, you Ooh, know, tables and chandeliers and dropping into dips and things. But, you know, both are acceptable forms, but there's just two different styles. So. I really mm -hmm. want to make the point. Um, it, it came up when we talked about the, the rating system mm -hmm. and 
also commentation and um, even in the different types of Vogue that now exist. Um, I think it's really important for folks uh, who are listening to understand that ballroom um, as a living culture evolves. Yes. Right. And so it's yes. a, a, and because like a lot of what people in the mainstream who wouldn't be otherwise exposed to ballroom experiences, things like Pose or something like this, the, which de- or Paris is Burning, which depict very specific points in our <laughs> history as yes. ballroom culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important that people understand that like, in 2020, uh, ball, the ballroom does not look the same way as it did in 1980. Totally. Yes. I mean, there's there's a group, uh, there's a house. <laughs> the House of Ninja. Of, house of Ninja of, cis, of, cis of cisgender, cisgender women. women. People are so up in arms about them. Oh my God, okay. I'm only up in arms about them because I think they're not doing a bad job, but like, I would love to be a bio. Oh <laughs> What? They, sorry. I think they're doing a bad job. I'm sorry. Oh, wow. I'm I mean, sorry. They, um, they, did, they, did get, they did get eliminated last, uh, last episode, so I guess... Yeah, but they won, they won the first episode, and I was like, fuck this! Like, <laughs> okay, well, first so of all... So it's funny. It's really funny to hear other people, like, outside of ballroom culture's criticism of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's funny, and Gabrielle, it's interesting you say that because okay, one thing I would like to do because I actually have is, less criticism about well, it. One, I would like to set the record straight, and I'm working I on. I'm not mad like, that they are in it. I am mad that they won episode one. <laughs> this is a meritocracy. I would no. love to Vogue. Please let me in. <laughs> All right. Well, you got to talk to Mother Dolores because okay. I mean, she might she might be recruiting. I mean, I will say this so cisgendered women have always been a part of ballroom. This is another thing I want to like Mm -hmm. put out. There is an interesting and fascinating history about straight, uh, bisexual and lesbian women in the ballroom community. Okay, because like even back in the day, there were tons of categories for butch lesbians. Butch Mm -hmm. lesbians used to walk um, not only for realness, but for other categories uh, for straight cis women and also like bisexual cisgendered women. There are also categories for them progressively over time. One mm-hmm. thing we have to remember for ballroom is it started out with the femme queens. They were the ones who created this culture yes. and they gradually ex- like allowed other people to enter. There was a time when there were no gay men walking mm-hmm. categories in ballroom. It was basically, as I mentioned before, with the queen, yeah, it, was like, the it was like a, it was like a drag pageant show. Yes. yes. And, and so with, you know, in the seventies, this is when, gay and bisexual men butch queens started lobbying for a category and finally they got one which was called butch mod face or the trilogy you had to be butch you had to look like a model and you had to have a beautiful face one Whoa. category right mind yeah. you today ballroom is like tons of butch queen categories it was never like that in its inception well it's nice and that I- there's evolution because it shows more acceptance you yeah, know? it's definitely, like definitely acceptance and also i mean the other thing we have to remember inclusion. also for cis cis women inclusion they you know they were also uh found you know really important for founding houses the house of mizrahi was partially founded with cis women the house of ebony um also a lot of cis women were caretakers they were taking kids in Mm -hmm. like you know acting again as mothers in Mm -hmm. in many ways like taking kids in who are on the street i you know person who comes to mind is shante ebony who is the grandmother of the house ebony an amazing woman who also, and you know, a lot of these people also cared for people who were dying of AIDS. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's interesting because like people see the House of Ninja, they're like, oh, what's the deal? And the thing is, I have to remind people, remember in Paris is Burning, Willie Ninja teaches classes. I don't know if you remember, there's a student yeah. who's in the studio. Who is he teaching? A lot of cis a women. Lot. That's in and Pose too. Um, in Pose. Damon and, goes to teach classes because yeah, it's a lot modeled of after Willie Ninja. Yeah. Bridge and Tunnel of, girls want to come and take one of book. Right. Yeah. But, but here's the other thing. You have to remember, Willie Ninja was the only person in ballroom who really saw it as a dance form like any other and treated it with a certain mm-hmm. level of respect and dignity mm-hmm. that sure. nobody else at the time saw. He was the one who had the vision of let's take this around the world because it should be treated like Alvin Ailey or like ballet or like totally. anything else. It's something For anybody who doesn't know who Alvin Ailey is, by the way, because I feel like a lot of our listeners don't, um, <laughs> Alvin Ailey, yes. the, but wow. classically trained black dancers doing ballet. Yes. Doing ballet, yeah. Ballet, Horton Technique, a whole bunch of other, mm-hmm. yes. But definitely, I mean, I bring that up just to say like, 
his legacy is that he really saw it that anybody can learn this and anybody mm-hmm. should because it's valuable. And I, and I say that too, because I, I think we're in this like very interesting political moment where, you know, yes, we should be mindful about appropriation and this sort of thing. But mm-hmm. I think we do ourselves a disservice when we say that black culture is only for black people or like that, you know, mm-hmm. black and brown LGBTQ culture can only be for this small sector of people because one, you essentialize it and you basically like there are so many butch queens i know with no rhythm darling you cannot vote to save your life miss thing i don't want to see you try yeah but you know what and 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 how dare you also discredit because like everybody on legendary that is years of work Mm -hmm. that is years of technique Mm -hmm. that is years of studying under the masters under people in the ballroom scene watching videos that that doesn't deserve to be on that oh yeah everybody there has put in the time and effort and that's what i'm saying when you when you essentialize culture like that mm-hmm. and saying only certain people can do it you basically rob it of its of its work element you rob it of of its of what makes it special which means taking it seriously and putting in the time you know you're basically discrediting people who have put in the time and effort and saying oh okay well some black queen can do it better it's like no darling that's no. part of what makes performance special that's why you have judges to tell you do i see it for you or do i not (laughs) well then maybe the editing on the first episode i couldn't see there but i thought the house of west should have won that episode oh interesting yeah it's it's interesting too because i think when i when you're there live it was very 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 different also you have to remember what the category called for because the category on the first episode was your house statement so mm. who are you right like i, I think it was who did the best job of telling who they were i mean the ninjas you heard willie on the audio they gave you the aesthetic they had the ponytails they mm-hmm. had the blocking i mean there was you know mm-hmm. it's no they t- did they t- did t- they t- really t- did and t- that's t- that's something too is like i mean um i think Ballroom gets compared to drag race a lot and it's very, very different. And, it, and to the point that when I first watched Pose, I was like, this isn't fair. Those are trans women competing. Like mm. that's not drag or whatever, but it's like, no. Yes. First of all, that's not <laughs> where that comes from. Trans women started it. And second of all, a lot of this is like, I've been watching drag race for 10 seasons now and I'm still learning, you know, mm. even like top model, you like, you get better at judging because of what the judges say and what they right. tell you. No? Yeah, no, I can see that. Gabrielle, are you telling me to shut up again? No, shut up. <laughs> now I'm telling <laughs> you to shut up. No, I just needed to know where to be and move. Um, are you going partying after this? <laughs> uh, one yeah. second. I'm so sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Um, we can keep talking. Yeah, no, but you're right. You, you learn. You were saying, like, you learn with, with each season, with, you know. Mm-hmm. real. <laughs> maybe you want to mute yourself? <laughs> uh, I, okay, we're going. We're, we're, we're back. We're back. <laughs> okay, we're back. Um, okay, well, another thing. I'm just going to talk about my learning journey because that's what everyone's accustomed to. It's just me talking about me and talking about how dumb I am. But um, I remember I thought that uh, shade and reading were both just Mm -hmm. from drag. And it Mm. wasn't until I watched Paris is Burning that I was like, (gasps) yeah, this comes from a place way before. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, RuPaul, of course, to her credit, you know, there's a lot from Paris is Burning, I think, that um, ends up on that show. Um, But yeah, shade, reading, boots, Mm -hmm. as we were saying earlier, realness, Mm -hmm. all these words, they they come from ballroom. Um, And yeah, you know, it's just, it's more reason why it's truly a culture unto itself. Can we define shade and reading and the evolution? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, with shade, as, as uh, Dorian Corey so beautifully puts it in Paris is Burning, it's, mm-hmm. um, well, actually, no, because she says shade began with reading, right? And reading, reading came first. So reading with reading, first. yes, if I, if I read you, right, I'm going to find some, some bit of you to like, you know, tease out. Mm-hmm. Um, and and kind of you know joke be clever because I also hate when people try and read it and it's not it's just it's rude bad, yeah. um, it's just rude <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
there's like, you know, because there's like a subtlety to to reading. It's where, you know, it's like roasting. Like in yeah, comedy, yeah, like yeah. you don't roast somebody by just being like, your mom's dead. Right. You know, <laughs> right, right, you do right, it by something right. being like, you look so bad that if your mom wasn't <laughs> already dead, she'd be dead now. Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> exactly. 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 Yeah. You know, reading you, you find that little thing and then you just go deeper and deeper and deeper. And so and throwing shade is is like that too. Throwing shade is like, you know, saying, you know, saying you know, I would say it's a clever way of throwing an insult, really. Mm -hmm. And and if anything, all these things kind of come again from like a black vernacular tradition, believe it or not, like th uh what is it called? Like uh, doing the dozens, I'm trying to like think of it, or the dirty dozens, basically, where you trade kind of insults with people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, um, you know, it's a, because the example she uses for shade, she's like, I don't have to tell you you're ugly because you already know, and that's yeah. shade. And like, <laughs> that, you do the that, Dorian Corey voice, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, and actually, that's I can say something like, around that you're ugly, but I don't have to tell you because you exactly. know you're ugly. Because you already know you're ugly. It's and, like, that's you're ugly. <laughs> and that's shade. And that's shade. I yeah, love you it. Know. Rem, I really um, want to make sure we get to this because we're yeah. deep in. Yes. Um, I want to talk about sex and sexuality um, in ballroom and like how they're expressed, particularly through the categories body and sex siren. Mm. right so yeah yeah what's about that yeah so i mean i mean i kind of started off by you know telling my personal story earlier about how vogue femme has really been a way for me to uh embrace the, Get the into femininity that sexuality the, the femininity <laughs> of my sexuality and mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um but also reclaim power over my own sexuality mm. right? um, yeah because uh I'm presenting it to you, right? And uh, I was taught a long time ago by a ballroom parent of mine that you have to already be in love with, with your presenting from mm -hmm. the back. And mm -hmm. you're just inviting everybody else to love it just as much as you do. Mm -hmm. um, right. And so, yeah, uh, let's, let's, let's get into it. Yeah. I mean, you know, ballroom, it's very intertwined with gender and sexuality. So much is it, so much of it is about gender as performance, right? Of like, we're talking about realness of like, what does it, what does it mean to look like a certain archetype in society? Uh, that's definitely a question mm -hmm. for the, that category. And, and I, I really feel like ballroom overall, it is about celebrating people at their truest, most authentic self i think mm -hmm. this is part of the power of that because i especially i feel like today we're so used to like instagram culture of like is this who this person really is or like they just look happy and all of their posts and then you know whereas like ballroom is like if you are not coming with a true authentic, authenticity authenticity of it's gonna like, show this is this is you, yeah. Oh, it definitely, it definitely shows. But um, also, it's so yeah. interesting that like you can, you, a lot of people are showing their authenticity by, in costume. Yes. You know, but yes. it's like, it's costume letting you express your inner you, but also um, like be the antithesis to maybe who you are in daily life. And like, yeah. or yes. it's like a channel to explore or something. Like there was one night after Drag Race that I was so jealous of all the girls looking so beautiful that I did drag makeup on myself. Because Good. I don't, yes. I don't wear makeup a lot. You know, like yeah. I don't see myself as a very feminine girl. And so like, mm. but, but even like, to do that and like push up my boobs or whatever. And then it wasn't like, this is hot for the male gaze. This is mm, hot for me. Hot for this you. is exactly. what I like. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, yes, that is that is what ballroom is. And, um, you know, to to this point, there, there are so many categories that are about celebrating, um, celebrating whoever you are to that fullest extent. So, you know, Gabrielle, you brought up these categories like body, um, and sex siren and even just like with voguing itself like i feel like sensuality has always kind of been part of um ballroom in a certain sense like body is actually like kind of like an older category um mm. and it definitely started with the femme queens um that you know this was like a category that they would walk and then i think over time it's expanded to more people and there are different kind of body types that 
um, are that compete. You know, you have like models body. There's like, you know, like there's kind of like yeah. luscious body and yeah, and so on. And and yeah, you know, body was the first time I really see, not not that there's not so many body positive accounts. There really are, but it was like, look at those hips. You know, like where in my whole life, it's like, you don't want to have hips, you know, mm, like, like, hip, right. and like, I'm a very womanly, what, like, I've always thought I had more, more squish than was good, <laughs> but then in ballroom, you know, like I used to be like, oh, I'm small, but fleshy, you know, and fleshy mm. was a bad thing, but in ballroom, it's like, look at those hips, look at those thighs, look mm. at those boobs overflowing, you right. know, like really right. appreciating and worshiping this body, you right. know, and, and. I think a great, a really fun thing. Remy, are we gonna have you walk body? I would love yes. to walk body. <laughs> I would Come love. On. It would be like do the first. I've it. always said I've always <laughs> wanted to do amateur stripping in a place that like mm. nobody knew me. But mm. I don't want to do that because I don't want to do it for the male. I, I want to feel sexy in public right. around people, but mm. I don't. I want to do it for me. And yeah. I, and I yeah. So. Ballroom is definitely a place for that. Because because the other thing, <laughs> Jinx, the other thing I was going to say, <laughs> you know, what's so interesting I found with uh, some cis women who are in the ballroom scene, um, what's so fascinating to me is like a lot of them find one of oh, space to finally explore or their femininity um, mm -hmm. for some of them. Um, and I think that actually has to do truly because ballroom comes from a black cultural tradition Mm -hmm. That is completely um, at odds with white supremacy because white supremacy, yeah, yeah. white cis hetero patriarchal supremacy says women's bodies have to look a certain way. Men's mm -hmm. bodies have to look a certain way. You can only look like XXXYZ. And mm -hmm. Ballroom says, no, we don't care about any of that. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Bring it as whoever you are. And if you love that, we're going to love that. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. like one of the things that I love so much about it. I mean, for me, it was the other way around where it's like, I was a little butch, a little tomboy, and I was constantly made to feel shame around my body for so many years. And it was only when I started walking butch realness where mm -hmm. I really started getting into my style of Vogue, of old way, which is I do a masculine style of performance, that I was finally able to access masculinity mm. and be celebrated for giving that because that's what my body always wanted to do, but I always felt like I couldn't because you know, society, my family, everybody's telling me this is the wrong way to be. Mm -hmm. So I think with ballroom, it's, it definitely is just like, you know, it's this place of true self-exploration for people, even through costumes. Um, and also I think a way to, for all of us to just come together and celebrate different people, different people's bodies, what they're giving, um, you know, the different questions you can ask with your movement and stuff like that. I, I yeah. just, you know, that's, that's why I love it. Yeah, so that's <laughs> something I've been looking into recently. So um, there's, for those of you that don't know, um, so there's a mainstream scene and then there's something called the Kiki scene. Um, and Kiki ki is hee <laughs> hee. Yeah, Kiki means like laughing, yeah. but or, or having a good really time. Like, having a good time. So, having right. a good time. So it's, kind of, right. so it's called the Kiki scene because it's a little less serious, um, and it's it's a younger vibe usually, um, less intense. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's I don't know. Really, I don't know about that. The Kiki scene depends. in New York is very. The Kiki scene like, in New York is intense. I mean, really, if I could just say just briefly, like the Kiki scene actually emerges in the early two thousands, and the mm -hmm. idea was there were the a lot of health agencies in New York City, specifically GMHC and Hedrick Martin Institute, wanted to do um, HIV prevention, other sort of like health resource uh, outreach to youth. And there were a lot of kids who history. wanted, yeah, you know, there were, <laughs> but I have to, you know, there were a lot of kids who wanted to Vogue and they were like, how do we set something up for them? Because it's not 1985 where you can just bring a 15 year old into the club and nobody asks yeah. questions. And honestly, yeah. they don't so, need to be around like right. yeah. certain things right. that exist. Exactly. In the exactly. So anyway, they started this idea of the Kiki scene and basically that became a place for 15, ages 15 to 24 to compete. That has expanded into its own It's like world teen clubs. <laughs> exactly. Yes. That's a, yeah. It's like the Mickey Mouse of like Mickey Mouse clubs. clubs. No, there used to be teen <laughs> clubs. I grew up in New York City and there would be teen clubs. Like there would be like a night that a club would rent out for like teens because like, oh. because like um, we didn't have clubs for us. <laughs> exactly. And we needed it. We needed <laughs> bottle service. I mean, um, it's such, 
That's such a New York predicament too. It's fucking, I, I love. It's, fucking it's, it's part of why I love. So I love fucking it. ridiculous. Um, yeah. So, but what I was saying about the Kiki scene specifically mm. for me, um, uh, as it relates to, um, you mentioned this idea of asking questions with our performance mm. and movement. Um, so I've been playing with the idea. I haven't walked uh, this category in the Kiki scene yet, but I've been mm-hmm. playing with the idea of um walking sex siren in the kiki Mm -hmm. scene i I would do it in the kiki scene because like i said it's sort of this more experimental place Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but me as like a bisexual man me as somebody who also like embodies like a very high femininity but also a more subtle but like intense masculinity as well i'm asking questions what a delicious blend (laughs) (laughs) i love that I'm asking questions about myself um, in my sex siren performance, like Mm. becoming okay with, in the studio, becoming okay with switching between feminine sexuality and masculine sexuality in the same performance. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people in ballroom have issues with that, but Mm. I'm determined to do it. (laughs) You're going to pave the way. You're about to be a pioneer, darling. Okay. Listen, I'm people, gonna pave the way with I, beards. Listen, but it took. I'm it gonna took make beards seeing. a thing. I'm gonna put glitter in my beard. <laughs> yes, do it. But it, it do took all of me it. seeing pe- uh, a body type like, let's say, um, Nico's prodigy, mm-hmm. an like a, an average but like fit body type that wasn't like super ripped or mm-hmm. super skinny to even know that I could walk sex iron and be okay. Right, mm-hmm. so it does take that vis- visibility sometimes mm-hmm. for people yeah. to feel comfortable saying that, like, oh, I can do this too. It, you exactly. sometimes need permission from somebody else to have the audacity to do it yourself. Yes, yes. Which, like, yeah. sucks. Like, I just, I, I, even as, like, a comic, I remember being like, mm. who would want to hear from me? You know, mm. but then you have to have the permission from, like, another Upper East Side Jew that you see. <laughs> 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 Girl, I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, Remy, did you yeah. notice go see me and I just did the mmm? Mm. Mm. So my thing is like, mm. I say mmm all he the time. He gets mmms and clicks. Mm, if he's yes. about to make a good point, it's no, uh. no, no. <laughs> do, do we want to address? Yes, I um, do. Since we're talking about sex siren, we obviously mm. have to talk about the history of sex work in mm. um, ballroom community and the LGBT community. Um, mm and um how prevalent it is and why yes so much to say Oof, it's so interesting have you seen disclosure disclosure is so watch disclosure that movie is amazing it's about the history of trans representation in media and there's a scene in there it's on netflix Netflix. okay perfect on netflix yeah i I thought paris is burning was going to be on netflix i told my mom to watch it last night and it's It's on youtube oh Oh, it's on youtube okay good. yeah and also fun fact the extras from paris is burning on youtube i watched that recently okay um but yeah so sex work in ballroom i mean well, I bring up Disclosure because there was a beautiful breakdown of kind of how femininity works in that documentary, which I loved. And it kind of described like how and why trans women can have this like hyper aesthetic that ends up looking kind of like Nicki Minaj slash Cardi B, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> they explain this like beautiful kind of cycle that happens where it's like, those women are styled by gay men who are mm-hmm. in touch with the trans women who are for some of them maybe they're sex workers and like as part of their sex work need to look super hyper feminine Mm -hmm. one for safety and two also for clients and like yeah it's kind of interesting how then that gets replicated for straight cis women in the mainstream like the kardashians and stuff like that and then this kind of like cycle kind of continues but my point with um sex work yeah there's definitely an overlap and it has to do with access i mean exactly about access i mean access to money access to jobs access access like you know black trans people could you know it's like yes we just you know had this major victory with the supreme court but you know I, I was at the Black Trans Liberation March, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago in Brooklyn, where 15,000 people mm-hmm. marched in Huge. solidarity f- for Black trans lives. It was beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really struck by the speakers because everything that they were talking about, you know, we're really, when we're talking about Black trans lives and supporting them, we're talking about like 
necessities. Like we're talking about housing, we're talking mm-hmm. about jobs, we're talking about healthcare. Um, and it's because of just the enormous discrimination that exists. It's mm-hmm. like for so many black trans women, they cannot get jobs because mm-hmm people discriminate against them. And so when, you know, it's like, if you can't get a job, you have to make money somehow. And so Mm -hmm. sex work uh, for some people is not always a choice. Yes, you have survival sex work. And so that's part of it. Um, And, you know, this goes for just anybody who was born into poverty and who has not been given opportunities. And, um, you know, that's, that's definitely a method of survival for quite a few folks. So it's natural that there are many people in the community who have that as part of, you know, either their present life or even their past life. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's part of that history for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I would just segue and say that a lot of the women who do sex work are doing it or were doing it with men who were living these double lives, um, you know, kind of like getting out who they really are, who they're really attracted to, which is lovely. It's lovely right. that they're able to explore that, but then their own self guilt or what society is telling Sorry, them that, is low. that they're disgusting for liking women who have penises or they're disgusting for you know associating mm. with these people, then that would get to the end. They would murder these women. Um, a lot of right. trans women, especially you know, you see it at the end of Paris is Burning, one of the, our main characters that we fall so in right. love with. At the right. end, it, she got murdered by a John. Right. Venus extrava- yeah, extravaganza. Mm-hmm. And um, trans women are still being murdered, especially trans yes. women of color. Um, and yes. the stats are astronomical. And it, I don't think anybody would have, nobody pays attention. The number is uh, striking. It's already, it's only July Black uh, and Latina trans women that have been murdered. Right. In the yeah. United States. I believe and that, it's and around 20 something now. Well, and that, mm, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. I think it's hard to get people to pay attention because you're talking about people who are marginalized in terms of like intersecting oppressions of being mm-hmm. black and trans and poor and you know mm-hmm. so many things so and why it, should we care about you why should we care about why? you Which, why do you, you matter know, right exactly exactly and you know the, this issue i think um uh for many of the black trans women who are murdered yes it you know links back to the men who are who have who are transphobic or Mm -hmm. have internalized transphobia and i think one thing that has kind of uh, i've been whether they're attracted or not like you i I also hate i hate the narrative that it's just like oh gay people who like are embarrassed by themselves like it's that but it's also people who are just homophobic who are going out yeah Yeah, exactly who are just homophobic and or transphobic and and the other thing that i i do think is important to bring up it's like we're talking also about intimate partner violence, which mm-hmm. is something that is huge. I mean, the, the numbers of just like women, like cis women who are also murdered by mm-hmm. partners is also astronomical. Mm-hmm. And I actually see that the case of trans women is like almost like it's part of that same conversation because we're, we're talking yeah. about violence that is perpetrated by men towards women, yeah, regardless yeah. of whether or not they're trans or they're cis. Mm-hmm. This is this is an epidemic that is like huge in this country, mm-hmm. and for Black trans women, the issue is not only is it like your whether you're being misgendered in your death, yeah. or also you know just. Also I read an just article pay- the other day where they named someone's dead name. Oh, I nice. did name yeah. somebody by accident once, and he was so mad at me, but I didn't know. And then we had a, a conversation about it, and I I was so yeah. upset that I had done that. Um. But, Dead naming for those of you yeah. who don't know is a, when you're referring to a trans person by their name yeah. given to yeah. them for, that they might they may or may not use. Yeah, anymore. and I had I had been going by what Facebook said because Facebook didn't let him change his name yet, mm. and so I put him on a flyer as his um, given name, and mm. I and yeah, he freaked out, and I was like, oh my god, rightfully so, I'm so sorry, and he was like, yeah, Facebook won't let me change my name, so it was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, right, but yeah, for, I think, you know, for trans men, we also are, 
like lead precarious lives too. People think that you just like flip a switch and become a man. And it's like, no, actually mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't happen that way. And I think the case of Tony McDade, sadly, you know, a black trans man who was killed by Tallahassee police this year is a, huge, is a, is a, is a prime example of one, you know, I mean, for me, it's definitely something I think about as a black trans man for myself of like, mm -hmm. yeah, if a cop sees me, they will not hesitate about pulling the trigger. You're, you're a black man in this world. And like, mm. that's that, mm -hmm. you know, still has meaning and weight. And yes. also I think for trans men, it's like, you know, the focus is so much on trans women, of course, because their lives, you know, they're so kind of um, at risk uh, in terms of like, you know, people attacking them and also um, you know, having some masculinity does afford you some privileges, but it is tentative at best. You know, there's still these different moments. I mean, I experienced so much misogyny, trans misogyny. It's just like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's probably from the butch queen. Think, yeah, yeah, from from damn near everybody at this point. And I'm yeah. like, okay, take your pick of like what what's today gonna be, but. Um, yeah, you know, the, it's, it's still important to talk about the ways that it affects all of us because it, mm -hmm. it definitely hits the trans community um, the hardest. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say, I know this is like a tiny bit off topic, but um, some people I've been noticing online who are in the LGBT community have said some insensitive things about other groups that they don't belong to or and they think that they can say those words and stuff because they also are marginalized mm -hmm. um but like within our community like there has to be growth and learning as well like i saw yes. um a, a drag race queen that i really look up to and they had tweeted something like i'm not going to say the word dykes anymore happy dykes because you like little teenagers are whining or whatever and this is a mm. white gay man mm -hmm. taking yeah. i don't a word. know why gay men think that that word is not pejorative um, <laughs> i mean it, yeah, it depends right? you know it it's depends who's using like, it but like Right, yeah right. and how you're using it i mean dyke right. is one of those like reclaimed words like queer where it used to mean something um very mean and nasty and i i mean i do i mean i definitely identify with being a dyke as part of my history of like a political being mm -hmm. like a political lesbian who is outspoken and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but yeah, I think people just need to listen and be, you know, this is again about eradicating toxic masculinity mm -hmm. means saying, A, I was wrong, I'm sorry, and mm -hmm. sincerely meaning that, okay, mm -hmm. like, because the thing is, we're not all perfect, we're human, so we're going to mess up from time to time, and better that we just respect each other and just say, I'm sorry, I hurt your feelings, I did not know, and then fix it, and then move on, right, mm -hmm. you know better, do better. Um, We're going to put two, this on a t-shirt. Normalize changing your opinion <laughs> when you yes. learn new information. You learn I, information. I didn't come exactly. up with that, though. That was a tweet I read. Yeah. Uh, no, but, well, but still, it's great. It still stands. It's, it's so yeah. important, you know, and it's so important to also just be respectful of other people, especially if it's not about you. This is the thing I give to If it's people. not about you. Why like, do you I'm not it's about you? Nobody's you saying like, you're a bad person because you said it. It's you're a no. bad person because you're doubling down now when somebody said you just hurt my feelings. Right, right. Instead you of have a choice. Yeah. Right. And we've right. been talking about that a lot lately because there's oh. a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of apologies flying around, a lot of non-apologies. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and I am such a stubborn bitch. Be like saying sorry is really, really hard for me. So like I'm on mm. the journey with everybody. Like I get mm. it. Because sometimes yeah. you think that you're being attacked or that they're saying that like you're irredeemable, you're part of the basket of deplorables or whatever. And it's like right, right. no, you it's in this moment culture. did something. Right. First of all, cancel right. culture is not real. Louis still has so much money. Like, <laughs> name me one person who actually got canceled who isn't touring with Dave Chappelle, okay? Oh, Stop it. Oh, oh, <laughs> Stop okay, it. Okay, okay, okay. Stop it. She, she, let us know how you really feel, darling, okay? <laughs> That's how I feel. Okay. She, she was like, I said what I said. I said what I said. <laughs> I can call them out because they don't know who I am. And if they do know who I am, then that's good news. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Yes. Just say oh. you're sorry and move the fuck on. That's the real. <laughs> yeah, and maybe, maybe do some reading. 
Yes, maybe. yes. Do some, Imagine. you know, educate yourself. Do yeah, better. and maybe do Just that do before better. you reach out to your friend of whatever you insulted and go, what am I doing wrong? Don't make other people educate you. <laughs> educate right. yourself. Google. Google. Get on that Google, okay? Or like, then, go follow. Yes, do you have to go party? It's Shabbat. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Forgot about that. My goodness. So Shabbat Shalom. I've, I've yes. Shabbat Shalom. Bit, so well, we can, yeah, no, uh, I think we've done a wonderful job, honestly. I think yeah. this episode has been so awesome. And Sydney, if our listeners have any other questions for you, would you be open to maybe doing yeah. a follow up? Yes, most definitely. Most definitely. I'm so okay. down. Awesome. Um, I would like to encourage our listeners to donate to House Lives Matter. I Wait, said. I have a question. Can mm-hmm. I ask why House Lives Matter? I chose House Lives Matter. Gabrielle chose oh. it. Oh, okay. Because I would actually say, I would I would suggest donating to like Black trans organizations. Okay. Like yeah, the like Oprah for Project. the girls. Okay. Yeah, um, for the girls and the Ochre Project. And yeah, I would actually okay. say direct it specifically to Black trans lives. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, the Ochre Project uh, and? For the girls. Yeah, I would say. For, for, the girls? for the girls is another one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch. I can send Gabrielle, like, I'll send you. Yeah. That's like, great, yeah. I mean, oh, we can put yeah. it in the episode description too. I'll do that with the links that yeah. we've been doing for the other ones. Um, that's awesome. Not that House Lives Matter is bad, it's just it, uh, in this moment, trends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, for me personally, I just, I don't, I think it's, yeah, I think it's better to put it in the hands of the folks who really need it. Uh, okay. So anyway. I have one final question because we did say at one point, you were like, Deshaun is, um, is talking to, on the beat um, and to the house music. Yes. Did house music come from ballroom? Ooh, that's actually a fun question. question. No, yeah, well, house music, okay. The history of house (laughs) music is, you know, so complicated, interesting. I mean, first it really starts with like Larry LeVan, who was a famous DJ producer at the Paradise Garage. And he was really good friends with Frankie Mm -hmm. Knuckles. And Frankie Knuckles uh, is a New York born producer, DJ. Okay, so no. Well, (laughs) well, I'll I'll say this. A lot of the early... Well, house music is maps onto ballroom because ballroom people are part of that moment of dance right. culture in New York mm-hmm. in the late 70s mm-hmm. and 80s. Mm-hmm. They did not, inv- ballroom people did not invent house music, but it definitely matured with ballroom. So, you know, there, when Gabrielle- there's house, house. Well, when, when we were speaking about, you know, the idea of like, there's different genres of voguing and they shift over time. Well, they shift with the music because- Ballroom first started with disco funk, which was in the late 70s. Then it moved into house, which, you know, then kind of moves into the 80s, 90s. And then now it's its own. Yeah, where you get the ha, which comes out in 1992 from uh, Masters at Work. And then that becomes kind of the foundation for music that is ballroom as we hear that crash on the floor, you know, that Mm -hmm. bidika, 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 ha. Mm. And that that's, you know, kind of what ends up becoming kind of contemporary ballroom music. But it's all rooted in house. Yeah. You know, four, yeah. four on the floor beat that comes from disco. Yeah. Like all of that, that, that healing it. It's it's totally there. So good. Yeah. Everything's intertwined. And honestly, learning about multiple things coming together is, is just it's like you find out so much about our collective history. And it hel- it makes it easier to like go forward. When you understand that everybody has come together to make something, it makes yeah. it easier to be like, okay, now what can we make going forward? Yes, yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yes. Oh, uh, okay, I'm, I'm ready. Walk. I'm ready for it. Luscious body, let's go. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> Um, you guys, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I have to ask this question. Oh, no. First, I have to find where everybody can find you, Sydney, online. Uh, what, where can they watch your show? All that good stuff. <laughs> well, um, they can find me. I'm at Sydney, S-Y-D-N-E-Y, Baloo, B as in boy, A-L-O-U-E, on my socials, on Twitter, on Instagram. You can find my website, sydneyblue.com, and find more info about me. Also, um, I would say for uh, to watch Legendary, you can mm-hmm. sign up for HBO Max. Um, I think there's like a free trial for the week, and then there you know, is. All the- <laughs> 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 those. 
Um, but yeah, that's another place to watch the work and, you know, just, just reach out. I, I'm always, I'm so grateful to be here. First of all, Remy, Gra oh. Gabrielle, like, Thank also, you Remy, for I want to, I want to say very quickly, I also didn't realize I saw you on that box explained on about Netflix. female or yeah. uh, orgasm because I knew, I knew the name. I was like, wait, this seems familiar. And your work, what you do, the awareness you raise is amazing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. No, it's important to not only have somebody who's dedicated to, again, like celebrating who we are and like truth and authenticity, but the fact that you look at sex, sexuality, that you create a space for such a taboo topic in such a fun and like silly way. Like, I love it. So thank, thank you. you. I'm very, thank very grateful you. to be here. Well, just it's remember, I started it entirely selfishly and, <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to come. So <laughs> becoming a better person has definitely been a byproduct, but it was not um, the first <laughs> intention, not the intention. Um, Gabrielle, where can everybody find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Lotus Revlon, R E V L O N, Lotus dot Revlon, R E V L O N, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, or nefeshwellness.com. Don't you have an underscore before Lotus? I got rid of it today. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Sick. Um, I was like, there's way, way too many people following me now, and now I need to be more accessible. So work. I got rid of the Okay. Oh my God, that's amazing. Okay, so yeah, that's like when I changed my name on Twitter from the we one to Remy Casimir. No one's <laughs> um, Yeah, you guys follow me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, if you're nasty. Um, <laughs> Follow us on YouTube. Uh, go to patreon.com slash howcome. Um, we just did a very large tea time about an episode that we are taking down and why mm. and Ooh. calling people out. And uh, I just have to say thanks to everybody who wrote on the Instagram this week in support of me and like the difficult situation that I was going through. Um, I love our community. Uh, it's really, really love wonderful. I love our companions. Uh, join the Facebook group if you need some more camaraderie. Um, and yeah, you guys, I have to ask this question to everybody after a sexual experience, which this has been. Um, Sydney, did you finish? I did. Okay. Beautifully. Okay, amazing. <laughs> okay, amazing. Um, Gabrielle, did you finish? Always. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I also finished. Um, I'm, I'm having a great time here. Um, you guys, thank you so much for coming and we'll see you next time on How Come. Goodbye. Bye. It's not you, it's me. I try so hard to finish honestly. They say you'll know when you go all the way from A right down to O. Oh no. I think that I still got a ways to go. Oh, oh, I'm sick of this and I have got to know. How come? How come? How come I can't achieve? How come I can't achieve? I'm rolling up my sleeves. I'm rolling up my sleeves. Oh, baby, I believe these guests can help. Cause I can't do it by myself. I wanna just. Yay! I love Yay. us. <laughs> so oh, great. Wow. So what great. So idea. good. What yeah. an experience, Remy. My, I feel very transformed. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Do you? I feel a little transformed. I'm glad to yeah. have made this connection between the two of you. you both Me too.